This is Rocky Mountain Man Recording. This is your host and narrator, Darlene London. And I am doing The Good Earth, audiobook part two, or chapter two. And I hope you enjoy it. There was this luxury of living. The next morning, he lay upon his bed and watched the woman who was now wholly his own. She rose and drew about her her loosened garments, and fastened them closely about her throat and waist, fanning them to her body with a slow writhe and twist. Then she put her feet into her cloth shoes, and drew them on with the straps hanging at the back. The light from the small hole shone on her in a bar, and he saw her face dimly. It looked unchanged. This was an astonishment to Wayne Lung. He felt as though the night must have changed him. Yet here was this woman rising from his bed, as though she had risen every day of her life. The old man's cough rose querulously out of the dusky dawn, and he said to her, Take to my father first a bowl of hot water for his lungs. She asked her voice exactly as it had been yesterday when she spoke. Are there to be tea leaves in it? This simple question troubled Wang Long. He would have liked to say, Certainly there must be tea leaves. Do you think we are beggars? He would have liked the woman to think that they made nothing of tea leaves in this house. In the house of Hwang, of course, every bowl of water was green of leaves. Even a slave there, perhaps, would not drink only water. But he knew his father would be angry if on the first day the woman served him tea instead of water. Besides, they really were not rich. He replied, negligently, therefore, Tea? Uh, no. No, it makes his cough worse. And then he lay in his bed, warm and satisfied, while in the kitchen the woman fed the fire and boiled the water. He would like to have slept, now that he could, but his foolish body, which he had made to rise every morning so early for all these years, would not sleep, although it could. And so he lay there, tasting and savoring in his mind and his flesh, his luxury of idleness. He was still half ashamed to think of this woman of his. Part of the time he thought of his fields and of the grains of the wheat and of what his harvest would be if the rains came and of the white turnip seed he wished to buy from his neighbor Ching if they could agree upon a price. But between all these thoughts which were in his mind, every day there ran weaving and interweaving the new thought of what his life now was and occurred to him, suddenly, thinking of the night, to wonder if she liked him. This was a new wonder. He had questioned only of whether he would like her, and whether or not she would be satisfactory in his bed and in his house. Plain though her face was, and rough the skin upon her hands and the flesh of her big body was soft and untouched, and he laughed when he thought of it, the short, hard laugh he had thrown out into the darkness the night before. The young lords had not seen them beyond that plain face of the kitchen slave. Her body was beautiful, spare, and big-boned, yet rounded and soft. He desired suddenly that she should like him as her husband, and then he was ashamed. The door opened, and in her silent way she came in bearing in both hands a steaming bowl to him. He sat up in bed and took it. There were tea leaves thawing upon the surface of the water. He looked up her quickly. She was at once afraid, and she said, I took no tea to the old one. I did as you said. But to you I... Wang Long saw that she was afraid of him, and he was pleased. And he answered before she finished, I like it, I like it. And he drew his tea into his mouth with loud sups of pleasure. In himself, there was this new exultation which he was ashamed to make articulate, even to his own heart. This woman of mine likes me well enough. It seemed to him that during these next months he did nothing except watch this woman of his. In reality, he should have worked as he always had. He put his hollow upon his shoulder, and they walked to his plots of land, and they cultivated the rows of grain and he yoked the ox to the plow, and he plowed the western field for garlic and onions. But the work was luxury, 
when the sun struck the zenith, he would go up to his house, and food would be there ready for him to eat, and the dust wiped from the table, and the bowls and the chopsticks placed neatly upon it. Hitherto he had had to prepare the meals when he came in, tired though he was. Last the old man grew hungry and over time, and served a little meal, or baked a piece of flat, and leavened bread to roll around a stem of garlic. Now whatever there was was ready for him, and he could seat himself upon the bench for the table, and eat at once. The earthen floor was swept, and the fuel pile replenished. The woman, whom he had gone in the morning, took the bamboo rake and a length of rope, and of these she roamed the countryside, reaping here a bit of grass and there a twig or a handful of leaves, returning at noon with enough to cook the dinner. It pleased the man that they need buy no more fuel. In the afternoon she took a hoe and a basket, and of these upon her shoulder. She went to the main road leading to the city, where mules and donkeys and horses carried burdens to and fro, and there she picked the droppings from the animals and carried it home, and piled the manure in the dooryard for fertilizer for the fields. These things she did without a word, and without being commanded to do them. And when the end of the day came, she had not rest herself until the ox had been fed in the kitchen, and so she had dipped water to hold to its muzzle to let it drink what it could. As she took the ragged clothes and the thread, she herself spun on a bamboo spindle from a wad of cotton she mended, and contrived to cover the rents in their winter clothes. Their bedding she took into the sun on the threshold, and ripped the coverings from the quilts, and washed them, and hung them upon a bamboo to dry. And the cotton and the quilts, that had grown hard and gray from years she picked over, killing the vermin that had flourished in the hidden folds, and sighing it all. Day after day she had one thing after another, until the three rooms seemed clean and almost prosperous. The old man's cough grew better, and he sat in the sun by the stern wall of the house, always half asleep and warm and content. But she never talked, this woman, except for the brief necessities of life. Rang long, watching her, move steadily and slowly about the rooms on her big feet, watched secretly the stolid, square face, the unexpressed, half-fearful look of her eyes, made nothing of her. At night he knew the softness of her body, but in the day her clothes, her plain blue car and coat and trousers covered all that he knew and she was like a faithful, speechless serving-maid, who was only a serving-maid and nothing more, and was not meet that he should say to her, Why do you not speak? It should be enough that she fulfilled her duty. Sometimes, working over the clods in the fields, he would fall to pondering about her. What had she seen in those hundred courts? What had been her life, that life she had never shared with him? He could make nothing of it, and then he was ashamed of his own curiosity, and of his interest in her. She was, after all, only a woman. But there is not that about three rooms and two meals a day to keep busy a woman who has been a slave in a great house, and who has worked from dawn until midnight. One day when Wang Long was hard pressed with the swelling wheat, and was cultivating it with his hoe, day after day, until his back throbbed with weariness, her shadow fell across the furrow over which he bent himself, and there she stood, with a hoe across her shoulder. There is nothing in the house until nightfall, she said briefly, and without speech, she took the furrow to the left of him and fell into steady hoeing. The sun beat down upon them, though it was early summer, and her face was soon dripping with her sweat. Wayne Lung had his coat off and his back bare but she wore with her thin garment covering her shoulders, and it grew wet and clung to her light skin, moving together in a perfect rhythm, without a word, hour after hour. He fell into a union with her which took the pain from his labor. He had no articulate thought of anything. There was only this perfect sympathy of movement, of turning this earth of theirs over and over to the sun, this earth which formed their home and fed their bodies and made their gods. The earth lay rich and dark, and fell apart lightly under the points of their hose. Sometimes they turned up a bit of a rock, or a brick, or a splinter of wood. It was nothing. 
some time and some age, bodies of men and women have been buried there. Houses had stood there, had fallen, and gone back into the earth. So would also their house, some time, return into the earth. Their bodies also. Each had his turn at this earth. They worked on, moving together, together, producing the fruit of this earth, speechless in their movement together. When the sun had set, he straightened his back slowly and looked at the woman. Her face was wet and streaked with the earth. She was as brown as the very soil itself. Her wet, dark garments clung to her square body. She smoothed the last furrow slowly. In her usual, plain way, she said, straight out, her voice flat and more than usually plain in the silent evening air. I am with child. Wayne Long stood still. What was there to say to this thing, then? She stooped to pick up a bit of broken brick and threw it out of the furrow. It was as though she had said, I have brought you tea, or as though she had said, We can eat. It seemed as ordinary as that to her, but to him, he could not say what it was to him. His heart swelled and stopped, as though it met sudden confines. Well, it was their turn at this earth. He took the hoe suddenly from her hand, and he said, his voice thick in his throat, Let be for now. It is a day's end. We will tell the old man. They walked home then, she half a dozen paces behind him, as befitted a woman. The old man stood at the door, hungry for his evening's food, which, now the woman was in the house, he would never prepare for himself. He was impatient, and he called out, I am too old to wait for my food like this. But Wang Lung, passing him into the room, said, She is a child already. He tried to say it as easy as one might say, I have planted the seeds in the western field today, but he could not. Although he spoke in a low voice, it was to him as though he had shouted the words out louder than he would. The old man blinked for a moment, and then comprehended, and cackled with laughter. <laughs> he called out to his daughter-in-law as she came, So the harvest is in sight! Her face he could not see in the dusk. But she answered evenly, I shall prepare food now. Yes, yes, food, said the old man eagerly, following her into the kitchen like a child. Just as the thought of her grandson had made him forget his meal, so now the thought of food freshly before him made him forget the child. But Wang Long sat upon a bench by the table in the darkness and put his head upon his folded arms out of this body of his, out of his own loins, life. End of chapter 2. I hope you all enjoyed this recording. It was very short compared to my last one. Chapter 2 is remarkably short. Only about 7, maybe 8 pages at the most. I will continue these audio recordings for as long as I am able. Uh, hopefully being able to look around school in between. Uh, again, I hope you enjoy them. If you like these audio recordings, please like the video, comment, and subscribe. Um, if you have any suggestions for future audiobooks I could record, please let me know in the comments below. And this is Rocky Mountain Recording, your narrator, Dari Munnan, signing off. Have a wonderful Valentine's Day.